lot of prominent Hong Kong activists who have who are living in exile. The Hong Kong government has put pretty hefty bounties on their head. Have have they done anything like that for you? It's very interesting. They, um, I mean, they've really targeted ethnic Chinese. Um, so one of them is my colleague Francis Hoy, who is our advocacy, advocacy coordinator based in D.C. I mean. I mean, the FBI ended up arresting uh, someone who had been stalking her a, a few years earlier, actually, when she was a student up in the Boston area. Um, uh, and then she's got a bounty on her head. Her family gets harassed. I mean, there are 13 of them. They each have one million dollar, one million Hong Kong dollars. It's about one hundred and twenty eight thousand U.S. dollar bounty. If, you know, you know, you turn Francis in and get her back to be successfully prosecuted in Hong Kong. I mean, it's a joke. I think it's a performative thing, but it's just very interesting. They've they they target uh, ethnic Chinese. Um, it's a very it's a very this is the other thing. CCP has a very racist policy towards many things. So Jimmy Lai is a British citizen. Just take one example that I happen to know about. He's a British citizen, full British citizen. Never had Chinese papers since the day he left China in 1961 uh, uh, to, to illegally come into Hong Kong. Always had British papers, British passport, nothing Chinese. The Chinese will not give consular access to the UK, the United Kingdom um, consulate in, in Hong Kong. He has the right to see a, a UK citizen in prison. They say he's a Chinese citizen. How is he a Chinese citizen? Never, you know, doesn't have Chinese papers. But, oh, looks Chinese, born in China. He's ours forever. So, the, I don't know. It's 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 just strange, uh, the fact that they kind of, you know, don't go after far and long may it last. I mean, I don't want them coming after me. Um, and uh, thankfully, as far as I know, they haven't. Uh, any reaction to the book that you have coming out? Well, it's not out yet. So let's see. Um, uh, they, they Maybe that'll get you the bounty. <laughs> <laughs> I, if well, so, please don't try to collect it. <laughs> well, well so this is a digital interview. We don't, we can't actually <laughs> lay hands on you. Well, so actually, uh, let me ask you about your book. So you, your t the title of your book is The Troublemaker. Um, I was going to ask you why you called it that, but I think it's it's fairly obvious. Uh, the, uh, the It's a book, of course, about the the, the sort of life story of, of Jimmy Lai. Uh, and it starts with him. Uh, it's, a, it's a crazy story, really. Like it starts with him being born in a, his family originally in, in Guangdong province they were not a poor family. They actually were, you know, pretty successful business people. His father was was successful, uh, but when the communists came, that success became a liability. Absolutely, yeah. And, and what what happened after that? Yeah. Well, by the way, I called it the troublemaker because that's how Jimmy Lai um, described himself to me, and and we were talking one time, and. Uh, uh, it's it it kind of unwittingly uh, echoes this great civil rights uh, icon uh, John Lewis, who said, "Make trouble, make good trouble." And uh, coinc and so I, I didn't want to make it sound like somehow he was tied up with John Lewis. And then, really surprisingly to me, in the course of um, of my research, I found out, in fact, Jimmy did meet John Lewis, and in fact, had John Lewis uh, make a video for the students of, of for the protesters in 2019, imploring them to remain nonviolent. And so I, there's actually a picture of, in the book of, of Jimmy, uh, another Hong Kong human rights uh, leader, Martin Lee, and John Lewis in the US Capitol. And so, you know, there is that sense of, okay, make good trouble, but, you know, let's keep the moral high ground. Jimmy is a huge proponent of nonviolence and uh, really had some issues with the violence that some of the students uh, engaged or some of the protesters engaged in in 2019. Um, and I guess maybe that's a, getting back to your your question. Yeah, so he's born, as he said, it's a liability to be born into a rich family. Their house was taken away by the authorities and, and you know, all these people moved in. They were reduced to, you know, well, living in poverty. His mother, this is a crazy story. His mother was the second wife of a guy who'd married into a prominent shipping family. And, she, and even Jimmy had to call her mother number two. I mean, his mother was really kind of humiliated in these circumstances. She was a peasant woman who was brought in to bear more children and take, you know, almost, well, act as a, I don't want to say a slave, but, you know, really act to support this other family. The first wife died. The, his mother was still badly treated. But the irony is she's a peasant, uh, you know, very poor background, humble background. But because she married into a rich family, after the revolution, she was treated as a class enemy and sent off to a labor camp. You know, I mean, so it's just like one thing after another. And I think the shock of as a young boy 
uh, seeing the family in very young boys, you know, still had a little bit of wealth. And then the, you know, the trauma of the, of the revolution, his father left for, for Hong Kong, his mother stayed, she's in and out of these, it, it may be a little strong, call them labor camps because she seems to have been able to come home on weekends, but that's, Jimmy always called it a labor camp. Anyway, horrific conditions. Jimmy barely went to school after the age of, I'm not really sure, seven or eight. Nobody really seems sure he, he repeated at least one, uh, one grade. I mean, so he doesn't even have a primary school education. His sister, he's got a twin sister. She had a photographic memory, breezed through school. I think Jimmy, you know, they're both brilliant, but wired very, very differently. And maybe she's more conventional. She's also a very, also a very successful entrepreneur in Canada. Um, having lived in Africa and America. I mean, it's really a crazy, crazy story of the twins. But my book is really only about uh, Jimmy. And uh, so he's this fidgety kid and he's he's like working the black market. He's, you know, they're using him because he's like six, eight years old. Um, you know, he's working as a porter at the Guangdong Railway Station. And it's the famine in China. There are 45 million people who are dying because of stupid Maoist communist policies that, you know, led to hunger. It's the greatest man-made famine in, in it's probably the greatest famine in history in terms of the number of people it killed. And it was a political famine, a man-made famine. He's working as a porter. Guy gives him a tip and then he reaches in pocket and gives him a half-eaten bar of chocolate. And Jimmy kind of a little furtive because he doesn't want to just eat in front of the guy. He turns around and has a bite of the chocolate. This chocolate, he goes, what is this? As it's chocolate. He goes, where are you from? He says, I'm from Hong Kong. He goes, Hong Kong must be heaven if you've got chocolate. And so that was almost like this Proustian moment for him. And he, he really wanted, he was 11 then, <clears throat> begged his mother for a year. Of course, his mother's not going to let this little kid go to Hong Kong. Things were so bad in China. His mother finally said, okay, go. And he managed to get a one-way visa to Macau and um, went there and then got on a fishing boat and illegally entered Hong Kong. And so He's sleeping in a factory, teaching himself English by reading the dictionary and talking to older people who helped him out a little bit. A dozen years after he gets to Hong Kong, you know, he's sleeping on a factory on the table in the factory. A dozen years later, he owns a factory. Very quickly becomes one of the largest sweater manufacturers in Hong Kong, if not in Asia. Selling to companies like the Limited and other, I mean, big American companies, first JCPenney, Kmart, Sears, then, you know, the Limited and others. Then he gets kind of bored with manufacturing, decides he's going to start a clothing company, a, a retail clothing company. So he, he starts this, you know, kind of fast fashion company. A guy named Tadashi Yanai comes down from Japan, learns from him, starts Uniqlo. Today, Uniqlo, Tadashi Yanai is worth $35 billion. Uniqlo is like revolutionized the, the global fashion industry. Tadashi Yanai was Jimmy's student. He wanted Jimmy to invest, you know, to, yeah, invest in the, in the, Hong Kong, in the Japanese operation. Then Jimmy gets bored with, with clothing. He's about to start a fast food operation. It was kind of his idea was actually what Chipotle ended up doing a few years later. Lots of ingredients, giving the consumer the illusion of choice, but not actually, you know, but making it very efficient. And, you know, he's a, a, an amazing entrepreneur. And that's one of the things that, even though I've known him for three decades, really came through in the research for the book. Then Tiananmen comes and he goes, ah, forget fast food. I'm going to go into media. I think that's the thing. He goes, the Communist Party is, you know, think about it. the Berlin Wall's falling, Soviet Union's on its last legs. Jimmy's like, media is freedom. 